You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Thor, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Lisa Scottolini. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. We've got a fantastic show for you today. But before we get started, I'd like to tell you about some sponsors. Jeff Sweat and his new book, Mayfly. It's actually a duology that's out now. You can join in the Mayfly Quest at mayflybook.com. Start your journey. Long ago, a mysterious plague hit the city of L.A., decimating the population. Only children were immune. Ever since, no one lives past 17, and no one knows why. There are clues all over the city. Only the most determined will recognize them, and only the cleverest will be able to solve them. Life is short. Can you outlive it? Go to mayflybook.com to join the Mayfly Quest today. And thanks to our friend Ernie Lindsay uh, for sponsoring the show. His Sarah, the complete series, uh, is on sale now. There's a link to it in the show notes. In Sarah, the complete series, a peaceful but hectic life is shattered for a mother and her children, along with her friends and colleagues, by kidnapping, murder, and vengeance. Those seeking retribution will go to any lengths. This bargain price collection contains over 600 pages of thrilling suspense, which includes all three novels in the Sarah series and the companion novella. Sarah, the complete series by Ernie Lindsay. Now stay tuned for the show. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Hannah Jamison on the show with me today. Hannah has a fantastic book that is out everywhere today. It's called The Last. And uh, guys, I've had this book for just a little bit, uh, for a few weeks now, and it is amazing. This is genre bending uh, at its very best. Uh, welcome to the show, Hannah. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to have you. Um, like I said, uh, our, our good friend David at Atria sent me, uh, this book a little while back and he, he raved about it, uh, several months ago, I, I guess right around Christmas and said, you guys have got to read this book and, and, uh, got to have Hannah on. So thanks, David, uh, for that. But this, uh, this book is phenomenal. It's, uh, I, I can't wait to talk about it. But before we do, um, we, we have, we begin each show with the same question. And mm-hmm. that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, first memory. Um, well, it's an early one. Um, I decided I wanted to be a, a writer or an author when I was about six. I must have been about six um, because it was at primary school. And it was during a creative writing task where we were we were asked to write a story. And um, I, I wrote something really sort of pastoral and lovely about a uh, wolf or a dog who kept returning to a, a forest clearing to watch all the flowers grow. And, um, oh, it's a, it's a big departure from what I write now. <laughs> um, but that's my first memory of thinking, oh, I'm actually good at this. I should probably uh, do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Did, was, there, uh, was there ever uh, a grown-up, an adult, uh, who saw your, your passion and encouraged that in you? Um, I was kind of lucky in that my parents did. Um, they never tried to talk me out of it, um, which, and they never also told me it was unrealistic and they also never told me it was hard. Um, so it wasn't until I reached the age of about sort of 18 or 19, by which point I'd been submitting work for a few years. And, um, and I, it was only then that I, it began to dawn on me that it's quite an unrealistic expectation in terms of a career that you make a living from. Um, it's not something that you can just go go into as a career path. Um, but in a way, I'm glad that they they didn't tell me that because um, otherwise, if I'd known how hard it was, I probably wouldn't have tried. Right. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes the best encouragement is just to not discourage. Um, exactly. Yeah. It, yeah. Just you know, you don't know what you don't know, and uh, and and that's you know, you're you're the better for it sometimes. 
Yeah, it definitely made me more um, like headstrong and kind of brave about it. Um, I don't know if it counts as bravery if, if you just don't know something. Um, but I, yeah, it, it did have a big effect on how I approached everything because I approached it with such kind of confidence uh, and just the assumption that it was going to happen for me. Um, and it still, I mean, it still took years. I mean, from the moment I started submitting to the moment I got signed, it was six years, um, which, you know, is a long period of time. Um, it's just that I started earlier than most people. <laughs> Well, you know, um, th- that sort of confidence um, uh, should come naturally to a writer, to, to someone who is used to bending the world to their will, um, you know, in, in some strange way. You know, we, we make up things and make up whole worlds. Um, you know, who, who's, who's to say we can't do it? I guess so, yeah. I mean, if you live in a <laughs> – I mean, I live in, my, in a sort of fantasy world most of the time anyway. So it probably does give me unrealistic ex- expectations for, for what happens out here. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, so you you probably were were a bookish kid. Did, did you read a lot? Yeah, I read. I read pretty much constantly. Um, I, I read. I read more than I do now. Um, I think that's the case when you're younger, and then you get older, and you have a schedule, and you have no attention span or energy to do anything. Um, but yeah, I, I read all the time when I was younger, um, and it didn't really matter what genre it was either. Yeah, well, I, I, that's what was going to be my next question: is were there any uh, genres or series or stories that really captured your imagination to the point um, that it uh, almost changed the way that you saw writing, or did you just absorb everything? Um, a, a little bit of both. Um, I remember um, like pretty much everything Philip Pullman wrote um, I was obsessed with. Um, but the books uh, books that had a big effect on me sort of before the age of 10 um, were the Redwall books by Brian Jacks. Um, and I, I remember being so affected by those and the whole the world building element. And I was so involved with these characters. I remember crying when like Martin went off looking for his father and um, I remember the descriptions of the food so vividly, um, and that yeah, it, it that really changed what I what I believed it was to be a writer. I was so immersed in that world. Were you a a, a big fan of mystery and and thrillers? Uh, when did did that passion uh, strike you? Um, probably my early teens, um, and that was I probably came into it more through film. Uh, than books because I began the first horror film that I remember watching was The Shining and then I also vividly remember watching Event Horizon with my dad when I was probably way too young <laughs> to, to be watching it um, but but yeah ever since I got into stuff like that I realized that I had a, a pretty much insatiable appetite for really horrible things um, and it, I just carried on further down that path the older I got until, you know, through like gothic fiction, um, you know, like every teenager who's ever lived. My favorite book was American Psycho for a while. And <laughs> also like, you know, another type of teenager. My favorite book for a while was also Crash by J.G. Ballard. Um, so I went I went through all of those stages. I love that. Um, you, you talked briefly a moment ago about, uh, the, the feeling that, that you, uh, kind of untouchable, that this was going to happen. Um, and then you got into the world of publishing and realized that it was a little, um, tougher, uh, than you thought. Uh, what was that first book that you wrote that did get bought and published? The first book I wrote, um, was a book called Something You Are. Um, that was published when I was uh, 22. Um, but I wrote the first draft of it when I was 17. Um, and it's about a, a, a contract killer who becomes obsessed with the wife of one of his employers when he's tracking down the uh, murderer of their teenage daughter. Um, and it's it's very much, it's a psychological crime thriller. The first three of my novels are set in this sort of London gangland universe. It, they're not really police procedural. They're they're much more sort of criminal criminal centered, um, because that was what I was interested in at the time. 
but yeah, those first three books were were a brutal learning curve for me um, in terms of like the finance, the financial aspects of the industry, like how hard it is to make a living wage um, from selling novels um, and also just working to deadline and working under intense pressure. Um, I dropped out of university when I was 23 because I realized I couldn't um, finish a degree and uh, finish this contract at the same time. It was, it was too much for me. <laughs> Well, you had, uh, you know, thankfully, you had this uh, foundation built of, of being a writer um, all of these years and practicing the craft and, and, and working toward that goal. Um, do, do you feel like those years as a teenager and, and working through uh, through school uh, and, and writing for, for fun, uh, do you feel like that, that building that foundation before it was a commitment to do so, um, do you feel like that that helped, uh, the process along? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you only ever learn by experience. So I, I mean, it took me so long. It took me years to get published anyway. So I, I was used to working around, um, I was working around college. Um, and then when I left college, I was working around a full-time job because I didn't go straight to university. Um, and then, when I got published, I had to sort of, uh, I had to maintain that discipline, um, which was really, really hard. Um, working around part-time jobs. Um, I was waitressing, I was bartending. Um, I worked in corporate, um, fi- I worked in finance for a while. Um, and I realized that, that the sacrifices involved with like wanting to be a writer full-time, they, they involve different difficult decisions at different times. Like sometimes I had to give up a well-paying job because I needed more time to write. And sometimes I had to take two jobs <laughs> because I needed money with which to have the time to write. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a really tough juggling act for a while. And um, I, I'm really fortunate to have been able to write full time for the last year and a bit. What was the book that, uh, that kind of made the difference for you, uh, professionally that allowed you to, uh, to go full time? Um, it was, it was my most recent one, The Last, uh, which has just come out. Um, it was, uh, picked up by, um, Viking in the UK and, um, Atria in the US. And, um, that made, I mean, it's been a completely different experience um, having sort of a living salary to to live on and to be able to sort of focus on my craft in the way that it's a day job. Um, it's been, yeah, it's been a completely different experience. But the first three novels and building that foundation and that tenacity, uh, it, it was invaluable. Sure, sure. Um, have Has the story changed uh, for you in, in the last, is, is the last... Um, so much different from the types of books you wrote before? Um, yeah, it's it's very different. Um, the first three are, are more straightforward psychological um, crime thrillers. Uh, the last is a dystopian novel with crime elements and with horror elements. Um, it's, it's, I mean, I've never really been that bothered by genre categorization, but it, I imagine it is quite hard to categorize from a, from a marketing perspective. Um, in some bookshops, it's in the detective fiction section and in, in, on Amazon, it's post-apocalyptic. Um, so yeah, it's, it's all manner of things, but it's kind of what I always wanted to write. Um, dystopian, um, literature is always, um, like my a writer who is a massive hero of mine and has probably had more influence on my writing than anyone else is J.G. Ballard. Um, and I've always wanted to write something like that, that kind of near future um, dystopia where it's it's not too far from our world. It's not it's not sci fi. Um, but, you know, it's it's uncanny. It's got the brightness and contrast turned up a bit. Right. Um, this book for me um well, for, first off, talking about genre categorization, uh, that is absolutely a, a thing um, that people are hyper aware of these days. And, and, and I think it's because of exactly what you said, you know, where do we where do we list it on Amazon? Where do we put it in the bookstore? You know, people need to know exactly what it is from the moment they pick it up because, yeah. you know, we only have 13 seconds or whatever it is, you know, with the, the as a person looks at a book, we, we need to know exactly what it is. Um, but some of my favorite books throughout time have been 
these weird genre mashups or, or, or the, the lines between genre are, are very blurred. Um, it, that does that do those concessions come into your mind at all, uh, in the writing process? Uh, but when you set out to tell a new story, do you start working through, um, you know, genre distinctions and well, if this book is going to be this, then I need to have certain elements of this or that. Does that factor in at all for you? Um, not when I'm writing, no. Um, and it doesn't really factor in when I'm reading either. Um, I don't really, I don't pick up a book because it's a crime book or if it's a romance or I, I just, it's all about the story for me. And in the writing process, I, I follow what the characters do. It's, it's not my job to kind of uh, work out a sort of checkbox of conventions and work out what, what, oh, what will they want here if they're reading this type of novel or, oh, I need an obligatory twist here. I need, I need a jump scare here. Um, I, I just kind of follow the characters. They kind of reveal the story to me. And with regards to the, the horror elements of the last, it's, it's what brings me enjoyment and entertainment as a reader. So I very much write what I would want to read. And I often write things that I feel are missing um, in some sense. I, I write the books that I, I desperately want to read but can't find. Right. I, I'm the same way. I, I have friends that only read military science fiction or <laughs> I, I have friends that only read epic fantasy. And uh, I, it just it blows my mind. I, I love a great story. And it, it's the reason that we have such a diverse um, lineup of guests on the show. I mean, yesterday I was talking to a an historical romance author and tomorrow someone will be on talking about dragons. And, you know, and today we're talking about, um, you know, dystopian, uh, horror, you know, novels with, uh, with an Agatha Christie twist. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's, I think there, there's so much we can learn about storytelling from each other and from different genres that, that will make all of our writing so much richer, I, I think, by loosing ourselves from those genre distinctions. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that when when authors do that, it it makes books kind of more relatable um, to me because life is never just one thing. Um, it's why I love shows like um, Twin Peaks so much because they're a mishmash of different events and you go from feeling a whole range of emotions, like you're always on the spectrum of, oh, that's a joyous scene that brings me so much joy. That's funny. Now it's scary. And that's that's really how we go through life as people. Like multiple things happen to us in the same day. Um, I think I read somewhere, someone put it fantastically, where if you have an argument with your significant other and you get a promotion at work, one doesn't cance cancel the tone of the other out. You know, human life as, as a tonal spectrum is very confusing. Um, and there are very few stories which manage to capture the complexity of our experience in that way. And I think that's what happens when we when we as creators um, branch out and don't conform to genre so much or take it into consideration. I think genre is kind of it helps as kind of a marker. It helps for marketing. Um, but I don't know. I always want something a bit more. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So let's talk about the last. Um, when I first got the book and began reading it, uh, I thought I knew what the book was and I was gravely mistaken, uh, <laughs> about, you know, 15 pages in. Uh, and then I thought I knew what the book was and then, you know, another 30 pages or so. And then I was gravely mistaken again. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm always fascinated about how stories begin, um, not necessarily where ideas come from, because ideas are everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, every everybody knows that. But there's something about the idea that is special, that that one that floats above the rest, the one that 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 becomes an aha idea. Um, when you're thinking about a new story, what comes first for you? Is it a character? Is it a premise? Um, is it? You know, a headline that you read in the news and then start playing out the what ifs from that. Um, is it a setting? How does it usually start to unfold for you? Um, well, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of both. I mean, it's, it's all of that. Um, but with the last, my process was, um, I had 14,000 words of a murder mystery that was set in a hotel that I wrote during, um, while I was writing my third novel, I think. 
Um, and I knew that I wanted to write that sort of very confined, very claustrophobic murder mystery. Um, but something about it wasn't inspiring me. And I felt like, and I need that, that motivation to like power through a narrative. Like there's no way I'm going to get a hundred thousand words out of something that isn't like lifting me up with excitement every single day. So, um, I shelved it for about a year and, um, the end of the world framing, um, came from a, a comment from a friend of mine in an email and he mentioned that he was commuting between two states for work. Um, he was commuting between um, New York and Mississippi um, every week. And uh, he's a historian. And I remember thinking, um, kind of unrelated to anything else that was being said, I thought, oh, my God, what if civilization broke down and you were completely displaced from everything you knew, um, your family, um, everything that you would need to be prepared? And um, I just... I don't know. It was like it was that light bulb moment. And I suddenly realized that the 14,000 words of murder mystery actually needed that framing. And I became obsessed with the idea of displacement. And I also became equally obsessed with the idea that historians should narrate the end of the world. I loved that as a, as a one line premise in my head. I thought I would rather the end of the world be narrated by anyone else but a displaced historian. Right. And that was where it came from. Oh, so, so let's give people a little bit of the setup. So um, we've got this historian, John, uh, who is on a trip and in the midst of, you know, the the travel um, a nuclear, a, a nuclear attack has has been unleashed. Um, and we gradually learn that it's bigger than, um, you know, than, than first thought. And uh, so we've got this stranded person uh it displaced, as you said, just, just ex the setup is exactly like you said. Um, but then other things start happening. And so, you know, the, the displaced historian at the end of the world is, is a fantastic premise alone. Um, and then we add in this, this Agatha Christie, you know, twist. We've got a murder and there's, you know, a handful of people. Which one did it? Again, a fantastic premise all by itself. Then we go a step further um, and add in supernatural elements. Uh, when did when did that start creeping into the story? And uh, when did you know that 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 again, that is what the story is about? Um, the the sort of implication of super supernatural elements um, that that came with the murder mystery. Um it wasn't something that was added later. It's because I'm a compulsive collector of ghost stories and I, I pick them up from everywhere. Um, and I love superstitions. I love urban folklore. Um, and the case itself, um, the body in the last that is found in the, in the rooftop water tank was um, partially inspired by a real life um, true crime case. Uh, the case of Elise Alarm in the Cecile Hotel in L.A., which was a really tragic and um, very mysterious case um, where a Chinese Canadian uh, woman, a young woman, went missing in this hotel in L.A. And she was found two weeks later in the in the rooftop water tank. And um, the, the supernatural elements of the novel, I, I found they fit so well, because I think in that moment of crisis, um, people do start questioning what they believe in and they would start questioning the very nature of reality because all the structures that, that we're used to, everything that dictates how we live everyday life is breaking down. Um, so the supernatural elements felt like a very natural part of every character's coping mechanism in this novel um, in that people are starting to question um, why they are at the hotel in the first place. Uh, they have survivor's guilt. Why did we survive? Uh, the hotel itself is a very sort of claustrophobic but vast structure, um, which is kind of terrifying on two fronts because there is always the the worry that there is there are more people in the hotel than they know about. Um, is it haunted? Um, is there some malevolent force guiding everything? Um, but that all felt like it didn't feel hard to bring that into the narrative that felt like something the characters would would naturally start to suspect and, and would start to worry about anyway um so the supernatural elements were a reflection of the, those deteriorating mental states the the book is told in uh 
in an epistolatory f- uh, fashion. We've got these this journal, uh, basically, that uh, uh, th- that is being kept, and, and we're reading about the story uh, in in this way. Um, when did you decide to tell the story uh, using that framework? I know you had the 14,000 words, and you, you needed this framework to tell it in. Um, why did you decide to tell it this way, through us reading the journal? Uh, and, and we drop into the story day three. Um, what, was the, uh, what was the decision process for laying out the story in that way? Um, it seemed like a kind of natural evolution from the fact that I only ever write in first person uh, perspective anyway. Um, I struggle with f- third person narratives because I become obsessed with who the narrator is. Um, and I, I, I sort of wonder why we're being shown some things and not others. And I think, well, is this narrator omniscient? Like, who's talking? Um, and I feel like first person narratives are much more convincing. They're so much more immediate um, and I can get inside the character's head properly. I'm not writing about them as an impartial observer. I'm I'm writing as them, um, which has always been more exciting to me. So the journal, uh, the journal aspect of the novel, kind of that happened very naturally, and it was it, it sort of arrived at its full form when I think it was my agent um, suggested I read The Martian. Um, when I was going back and doing some editing and I thought the Martian was, um, was so well written and it, it really benefited from that particular style. Um, and I realized that the opportunities I had for comedy, um, and the opportunities I had for suspense by using this particular style. And, um, so yeah, it was, it was a combination of things, but reading the Martian really helped with that. I love that. Um, the, uh, you know, it, it's interesting by, by, writing in first person and then especially in a journal like this um you know one of the things you have to worry about in third person is uh is info dumps where you're just telling things to uh to the reader um when there might be a better way to show that there might be a better way to include that in dialogue to make it more um to to not break you know the experience for the reader and that sort of thing when you write like this you can speak directly to the reader and there's a certain relationship that develops between um, the the writer slash narrator and and the audience the um, the, the reader um, where it it's kind of a, a constant running dialogue um, are there ever any things that crop up in in telling a story first person this way that you wish um, you had more freedom to do that, that maybe um, it, that maybe telling it from third person would allow you to step outside and do something different. Um, do you ever feel stifled from that? I guess is what I'm asking. Um, I, I don't think I feel, I don't think I ever feel stifled, um, by it, but there, there are certainly limitations in that you are writing from the point of view of only one of your characters. Um, right. and, uh, I, I was actually asked a really interesting question recently about how I reconcile being a, a feminist, writer with uh the decision to have a man as my protagonist in the last um and john is a you know he's a he's a white male liberal academic and um that was a very deliberate decision and um the wider cast of characters is is much more diverse there are there are white women there are black women there are mixed race um young men and there are black men and um i wanted to look at all of these characters through john's perspective And I was always very aware um, that John has an identity and that identity is going to influence how he interacts with certain people. Um, So from my perspective, I don't think it's about being a feminist. I don't think being a feminist writer is about just, you know, shoving a woman up front and going, look, it's feminist. Um, Right. It involves being honest about everyone that you're writing about. It involves like aggressively humanizing everyone and also making your characters aware of where they're dehumanizing other characters by habit. Um, And part of John's journey in the last um, and the journey that I kind of took him on is coming to terms with where in his life he has lacked humanity um, when dealing with other people. Um, And he has to come to terms with where he's been cruel. He has to come to terms with... Uh, having been unkind and he has to really bridge that gap between believing he was a good person and you know being now being in a crisis situation where he has to act like a good person 
Um, so he's really being he's really being confronted with a lot of his past actions, and he reflects on that more and more as the novel goes along. So um, yeah, I mean, I'd love to have delved into other characters' backstories, um, especially like character y- like young women like Tommy and Tanya. Um, but yeah, I mean, John was a very deliberate decision, and I think the journey he he went on was really it was really fascinating to me watching him grapple with these moral questions. Well, isn't that really the power of story? Um, you know, we can tell people to not behave in a certain way. You should never treat people this way. Um, you should never talk to certain people um, at, in a demeaning way. Um, you can tell people that all all day long, and and some people will get it, and some people will never see um, that deficiency in themselves. But if we wrap that in story, and we allow the reader to look at a situation through someone else's eyes and it becomes apparent where the shortfall is isn't that more powerful than telling someone do this or don't do that i think it really is and i think that's the difference between writing something that you know first and foremost is is entertainment it's not a polemic um i didn't go out to write you know I want people to explore these questions, but I don't want to throw the questions in their face. You know, they're experiencing these things through John. And one thing that's um, like that's really given me a lot of pride is how many people have read the last and messaged me to say it really made me think about what I would do in that situation and how I would react to the people that are around me in that situation. And I thought, well, that's that's kind of my job done <laughs> as as an author. Like you wanna you wanna entertain people and you want people to have a great time reading your novel. But I mean if you can make people think and if you can make people put themselves in other people's shoes like that, I think that's like that's so powerful. Yeah, yeah. And like you said, job done. Um if we can if we can see a bit of ourselves in John, if we can see a bit of the people around us in John, if we can see and then hope that, that we make better decisions or or we're we're proud of the decision ultimately made, then then we have connected with, with that character and I think connected with our own selves in the midst of it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and I've been really, one thing I've also really liked is how many people, um, like, you know, men and women have contacted me to say that they hope they react like Tommy. Um, and, uh, I I found that, I found that really entertaining, like loads of people kind of looking at how this, you know, this young woman reacts with such, um, with such composure and such competence and going, God, I wish, you know, I hope if the time comes, I react, I react that well. Um, and, you know, she might not be the best example of how to act. There are, you know, there are characters whose reactions range from, you know, throwing themselves into their work like Tanya. Um, and there are characters who react by just kind of, you know, really shrinking into themselves. Um, but, you know, that's I, I wanted to explore all of these reactions to crisis. Um, how has your writing process changed Uh over the the course of uh, of the four books that you've written and and the last, uh, I know that you had a a little different experience in that you were uh, able to pursue this book with with a little more freedom, um, you know, with the, with the book deal and and things like that. But how have you grown as a writer throughout all of your projects? And uh, is there something that you have learned that uh, that you take with you uh, from from growing as a writer? Um. I've definitely become more disciplined um, than I, and that's, that's purely out of, out of necessity. That's just growing up. I think, Um, you know, I'm in my late twenties now. Um, When, when this whole process started, I was 20, 21. Um, And that's, you know, you change so much during that time anyway. But when I wrote the last, um, I wasn't writing uh, full time that, that came after I sold it. Um, the last I actually wrote with the last, um, you know, the last of my book money from my third novel, which was not a lot. And um, I moved to another city and lived on a, a shoestring budget, paying pretty much no rent, living in a spare room. And I wrote it in five months. And um, I wrote it while knowing that if this didn't come off, I did not have a plan B. Like there was nothing else I could do if this book didn't sell. Um, and by the time I finished writing it, I, I was, you know, I waitressed for that last month to to earn the money to actually move back. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the, the last was a real Hail Mary pass for me. Um, but a few things, a few things that I learned 
um, that was actually like properly applicable writing advice was um, from a Joss Whedon piece called How to Be Prolific. Um, and I think, you know, take all writer's tips with a pinch of salt, like some of them are useful, some of them are not. But, but these ones like really changed how I approached the whole craft. And one of them um, was called Eat Dessert First. And I used to be really wedded to the idea that I had to write everything in sequence. I had to write chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. And um, even if there was something I was really excited about writing and it was 10 chapters in the future, I had to wade through all of this other stuff to get to it. Um, and now, now I just write that. Now I just write the scene that I'm excited about and I just write another scene that I'm excited about. And then I write a few in sequence and then I might write the ending. And, and um, the way that this has really helped is it just keeps your ideas very free flowing. And it means that on the days you don't want to turn up to write, you already have a project that you're really passionate and excited about. Um, you're not trying to reward yourself with the good writing days by wading through a load of bad writing days um, or more difficult writing days. So I think, you know, writing things out of sequence has been a real game changer for me. I love the idea of that, uh, but it kind of makes me break out in a rash um, <laughs> really? a little bit thinking <laughs> I, um, um, I, I, I've talked with Diana Gabaldon, uh, about the Outlander series and, and she said that she just writes scenes as they come to her mm-hmm. and, uh, and they're, you know, all out of, um, out of order and then stitch them together later. And, and that just, that makes me, um, go a little batty. Um, but I also love the idea of writing the idea that's fresh and that's exciting to you and, and getting that out of the way. Um, how do you, how do you manage that with, um, with, uh, you know, keeping something on schedule and keeping the story going in the right direction? And, and do you have a plan for the story from the beginning? Um, I usually have a very loose idea of where the novel ends and a very loose idea of where it begins. And I have checkpoints that the plot hits. But apart from that, I don't like to plan too much because I kind of discover the story through my characters. And I always find that when I try and force them to do something because, you know, I feel like it would be good for the plot, it just doesn't work. Um, So everything, (laughs) everything's very intangible for me. Um, and most of the book does, does actually end up being written in sequence. Um, it's just if a scene really leaps out, um, I I have to get it down. Otherwise it's just going to bother me and it's going to be all I think about. Um, so it's best to just get ideas out while they're fresh and while they're exciting. Um, but yeah, most of the book does end up being written in sequence. Um, but it's very much dictated by the characters, not by what I think is, um, you know, appropriate at any given time. Right. So the book is out today uh, in the uh, in the U.S. uh, for our friends um, across the pond. It has been out for a couple of months. Um, What are you working on now, uh, Hannah? I know that, um, uh, you know, a lot of times by the time uh, we're holding the book in our hands, this has been a work that has been, you know, uh, underway for sometimes a couple of years. And, And a lot of times the author has moved on to a new project while we're enjoying uh, you know, the book for the first time. Uh, what are you working on now? Um, I'm working on a, a couple of things. Um, the main project I've been working on for the last sort of year um, is a TV series. Um, it's a project I've, I actually came up with in 2011, um, but I just never had time to do um, because I've, I've always had novels to write. Um, but when I sold the last, I ended up with basically a year of breathing space and I, I was able to use that time to finally teach myself how to screenwrite and get this other project off the ground. Um, but it's nothing like what I've written before. It's a historical drama and it. it's based on a true story. Um, I can't tell you too much about the plot, um, but it's, it's US history. It's, it's based in the 1930s and it's based in the American South. Um, and it's, it's always been a subject that's really interested me. And that's taken a lot of research. I mean, the, the last few years have been purely research and screenwriting for that project. Um, I have just started book five, um, which isn't a sequel to the last, but in terms of genre and tone, it's, it's definitely in the same ballpark. Um, it's going to be another mishmash of genres because that's what I find interesting. Um, but it's based on, it's kind of based on something that, that happened to me and I I kind of extrapolated it out into a, 
into a sort of disaster scenario. And again, it's it's going to be it, the closest way I can probably describe it as something like a dystopian love story. Um, that's what I'm writing at the moment. Well, as someone that lives in the American South, I can't wait to see what you come up with. Um, that sounds like a lot of fun. Oh, where do you actually um, live? <laughs> in Mississippi, actually. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, um, the last is out available everywhere. Now, um, we're going to send everybody to pick up their copy of it. Hannah, um, where can people find you online if they would like to, uh, find out more, dig into your back catalog and follow along with what's coming up next? Um, Twitter is probably the main social media platform I use. Um, so yeah, if you read the book and you enjoy it, uh, tweet me. Um, my Twitter handle is Hannah underscore Jameson, Hannah without an H on the end and Jameson like the whiskey. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Hannah, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. We're going to link up your Twitter and your Amazon page in the show notes. Yes. Um, I, I love the book. I'm, I'm sending everybody I know to go pick it up on release day. Um, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. That's great. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the author stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. I'm melting! I'm melting! cried Joey. Take the picture already! He stood with one arm around the bronze waist of the bewitched tribute statue, Samantha Stevens, riding a broom across a crescent moon. Jason tried in vain to frame the shot without any tourists in it, but that was impossible. From all points of the compass, a merry horde had arrived for Salem's two-day summer psychic fair. All the commuter trains had burst open, like cornucopias filled beyond capacity, spilling endless fruits and nuts onto the red brick sidewalks of Essex Street. A vampiress in lavender shorts and feathered boots sold maple chocolate walnut fudge in front of the Witch City Tattoo Parlor. A near-naked gypsy in purple-green veils danced with a pheasant in her arms around a plug-in Hanukkah menorah. A fat man in a fetching blue jeans dress sold amethyst and citrine charm bracelets in front of Medusa Cafe, but his stand got knocked over by a one-armed crone driving a mobility scooter who sang, Choo-choo! as she passed, her stump on the wheel, her lipstick ghastly, her gnarled right hand raised in trailing plumes of noxious cigarette smoke. Chewbacca leapt out of her way and slapped sparks from his fur. He gave a disgruntled growl before going back to playing summer lovin' on his ukulele. The old one-armed dervish drove off, choo-choo, parting a crowd of wanderers, slack-jawed tourists with camera straps tight across their bellies, yellow-vested police on segways, elderly rollerbladers, face-painted infants and harried parents, and college girls. So many hot, hysterical college girls that you'd think somebody had napalmed a sorority house. Jason, are you deaf? Sorry. Jason raised the phone and took the shot. Joey inspected the photo and nodded in approval. Your turn. No, thanks. Do it, Shaggy. Don't make me hex you. Jason gave in and traded places. He put an arm around Samantha's metal back. Her bronze body had flushed in the afternoon sun, Warm through his glove, but her eyes were weary. No, downright creepy. And her smile was forced, like a Disneyland princess who'd had her toe stomped. Say chowda, cried Joey, who'd been practicing his New England accent all morning. Come on, man. Say chowda. Fine, chowda. Joey got the shot and Jason surrendered Samantha to a chubby kid wearing a Gandalf beard who climbed up to worship her bronze bosom. Flesh, Blood, Steel, the new book from David Allen Jones. 16-year-old Jake Harris wakes up after a horrific car accident to find 13 years have come and gone. He is 29 years old, a cyborg, and one of the world's most feared assassins. Horrified by the things he's done, things he can't remember, Jake vows never to kill again. Unfortunately, the company that owns Jake has other plans. They're not about to lose their top hitman to the errant memories of his teenage self. 
When Jake manages to escape them, they launch a worldwide manhunt that ranges from a near-future New York City to Paris. Desperate to remain himself, Jake joins a rebel faction dedicated to wresting control of the world's governments from the hands of militarized corporations. Using his enhanced body and perceptions, he is able to aid them in their fight. But Jake doesn't realize the rebels have their own plans for him, ones that involve unleashing his unique talents on their enemies. Faced with a dark past he can't recall and uncertain whom he should trust, Jake must come to terms with the sinister choices that molded him into the man he became. The question is, can he avoid doing it all again? Assassins are born, they're programmed. Flesh, Blood, Steel by David Allen Jones. <laughs>